Thank you, choir. Almost felt as if we were there as they sang for me. To be transported back to that moment in time when a crowd, what kind of crowd was it? You ever wonder about that? Who was in that crowd? I was reminded this week that there probably were two processions that took place that day into Jerusalem. The one that we celebrate here, known as Palm Sunday, where the people shouted out, Hosanna! Hosanna! What does that mean? What does it mean to shout Hosanna? Anyone know? Save us. Save us. Save us. Where it's on the other side of the city. Jesus rode in on a donkey, on a colt. Symbol of peace. Crowd filled with peasants. Asking for deliverance from the guy coming in on the other side of the town. The representative of Caesar, the emperor, riding in on a what? Horse, stallion, with infantry. Two contrasting processions. When we think of following the way of Jesus, which way do we follow? Palm Sunday. This morning we continue our series of sermons on the promises in the cross. Not just the cross of Christ, which saves us, but also the other parts, the other aspects of the cross. We've looked at the promises in the soldier's spit, promises in the sign, the promises in the path, and this morning we look at God's promise to us in the blood and the water. When I was growing up, my picture appeared in the local newspaper several times. First time I was in sixth grade, state finalist in the Recycle Ohio Creative Writing Contest. I remember my sixth grade science teacher sharing this clipping on his overhead projector, and he says, I thought it was a wedding announcement. <laughs> That's a little embarrassing. Perhaps I held on to that a little bit, because year later in the year, I fell asleep in his class, and I, I, I told him if his class wasn't so boring, I wouldn't have fallen asleep. I don't know. I was looking at this today, and I, I can't believe that they published my address in the newspaper. <laughs> Anyways, whoops, wrong button. Now, five years later, though, the Canton Repository and Akron Beacon Journal featured me in stories about a mission trip that I took to Russia after I performed well in a national Bible quiz competition. These appearances, at least this one, I think the first one was more of a participation trophy, but this one was the result of my hard work and effort. Felt great to be in the news, especially when Mr. Wilson, who happened to be on my paper route and was also the high school basketball coach, sent me a note that said, hey, Dave, I want to be your PR director. <laughs> as great as that was, though, what I really, really wanted to do was I wanted to be in the sports section. Not the life section, the sports section. You know, I wanted to be the kid that made the winning shot or, you know, came in first in the race. That's what I wanted. My picture never appeared, though, in the sports section until the fall of my junior year when our cross-country team qualified for the state meet. Our team appeared in the sports section. 
Now, if you're not familiar with cross country, only seven team members compete in the race. And only the top five score points by where they finish in the race. And the goal is to finish with the lowest amount of points, right? You want to be first. That only counts as one. Two counts as two, et cetera, et cetera. The team with the lowest point total wins. Now, it's a great format because if a runner is slow in one race, say he or she stayed up a little too late on Friday night or Thursday night, or if he or she makes a mistake on the course, the mistakes can be covered up by his or her teammates. Now, what was great about appearing in the paper, although this wasn't the exact picture, I couldn't find it, uh, I am old enough to be pre-internet days, um, what was great about this is, is, is my picture appeared in the paper even though I wasn't one of the top seven runners. I wasn't going to run at the state meet, but my picture was still there. You see, I'd given up a summer of training to go to Russia, but it didn't matter. When the picture of the team showed up, I was in the sports section with my faster teammates. I'd made it, baby. We were all recognized as qualifiers for the state meet. I got credit for the hard work of my teammates who had trained all summer long. Now, when I think about how my childhood dream of being in the sports section came true, I think how it's not too far from what Jesus has done for us, for me and for you. Because of my performance of my teammates, I was recognized in the sports section. Likewise, we're recognized in the Book of Life, a different newspaper, if you will, because of Jesus' life and death. We're given a place of honor, not because of what we do, but because of whom we know. And the theological term for this is what? It's justification or positional sanctification. But there's also a second theological reality illustrated through my cross-country team, and it's equally an equally clear picture of what's called progressive sanctification. The top seven runners qualified for the state meet because we were a team. We continually improved over the season because we worked together. We encouraged one another. We met together and held one another accountable to good eating and sleeping habits. And all the members on that team aimed for the top seven spots. And that mutual, friendly competition improved our team. I might not have offered much on the race course, but I contributed to the team in other ways. We succeeded because of the mutual spirit of teamwork that was working in us. Max Lucado says, positional sanctification comes because of Christ's work for us. Progressive sanctification comes because of Christ's work in us. Both are gifts of God. The author of the book of Hebrews in the New Testament says, by one single sacrificial offering, Christ did everything that was needed to be done for everyone who takes part in the purifying process. Do you see it and hear it? Everything that was needed to be done, justification, positional sanctification, Everyone who takes part in the purifying process. Progressive sanctification. In his online devotionals, Rethinking Salvation, Anglican theologian N.T. Wright tells an old story about a bishop on a train at the end of the 19th century. But the bishop wasn't wearing bishop clothing. And so a young lady from the Salvation Army was sitting next to him, and she asked him, Are you saved? And he replied, It depends whether you mean sothis sophamanas, or sothosamanas. Sothis, sothamanas, or sothisamanas. Sothis is the word for being justified. Saved once and for all. 
So thamanos is the word for being saved. It's a continual process on the way to salvation. It's progressive sanctification. Both are essential. We need God's work for us and God's work in us. Without the first, we can be fearful. Without the second, we can become slothful. And these gifts are revealed at the base of the cross of Christ as found in the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 31 to 37. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because the Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth so that you also may continue to believe. These things occurred so that the Scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of Scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. When they came to Jesus, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. Why does the Gospel writer of John draw our attention to this detail of the blood and the water? Now, in our Baptist tradition, there are several wonderful, wonderful hymns about the blood, right? What can wash away my sin, right? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I'm not going to sing, Brian. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There is power in the blood. These hymns illustrate what even a casual student of Scripture will note, that there's a connection between blood and mercy, and that connection is discovered through another detail in our Scripture. It says when they came to Jesus and saw that He was already dead, they did not break His legs. These things occurred so that the Scripture may be fulfilled. None of His bones shall be broken. The reference there is to the story of the Exodus. Exodus chapter 12. The story of the Israelites' redemption the story of their salvation from another empire, from Egypt. If you know that story, you know the final plague was the death of the firstborn in Egypt. And you will know that what saved the Israelites from the angel of death was the blood from the Lamb. The blood from the Lamb that was what? Smeared on the doorposts of the Israelites' home. The blood marked that those who lived within belonged to God. It marked them as God's children. And so the blood is a sign of belonging. We are marked when we accept the gift of Christ's death and His life, His shed blood. We are marked as the ones who belong to God. Again, the writer from Hebrews says, He entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with His own blood obtaining eternal redemption. The Son of God became the Lamb of God. The cross became the altar. And we were what? Made holy through the sacrifice Christ made in His body once and for all time. Does the sacrifice need to be offered again? No. You're justified by Christ's action. Right? Just as the achievements of my cross-country team was credited to me in the newspaper, so the achievement of what Christ has done is credited to you. We belong. We are marked as God's children. But life doesn't end with that marking. The progressive work is ongoing. So Thes is complete, but Sothamanas continues. 
And God's progressive work in us is seen in the water. There's another story in the Gospel of John. It's the longest story. It's the longest dialogue in John's Gospel. It's between Jesus and the woman from Samaria, the Samaritan woman at the well. And in that conversation, Jesus says these words to her. He says, the water I will give will become a spring of water gushing up inside that person, giving eternal life, giving life in God's kingdom, giving life in God's kingdom, so to speak. Right? In in John's gospel, eternal life is the synonym for kingdom of God in the synoptic gospels. So Jesus says, it will become a spring of water, this water that I will give. And Jesus offers not a single drink, but a perpetual well. And the well is the Holy Spirit of God working in you. Later in John, it says, if anyone believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow out from that person's heart. Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit. It had not yet been given because what? He had not been glorified. He had not yet been raised to glory. You have to understand in John's Gospel that is referring to Jesus' crucifixion and then resurrection. So water in this verse is a picture of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus working in us. Working not to save us, but working to change us. It's the so thamanas, it's being saved. It's that process of being saved. Paul said it like this, do the good things that result from being saved, obeying God with deeper reverence, shrinking back from all that might displease Him. For God is at work within you, helping you want to obey Him and then helping you do what He wants. As a result of being saved, what do we do? We obey God with deeper reverence. We pull back from that which might displease God, and instead we do the things that God is at work doing within us. We love our neighbors. We cease from gossip. We draw near to those who are in pain, asking what does God want to do about that? We lament the ways that we participate in oppression, We stand up for what is right and good and just. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God? These are the good works that result from what God has done in our lives. Think about it this way. How many parents are in the room? Okay. When a baby is born... The people who claim that baby, who belong to that baby, they become what? They become parents. There's no turning back at that point. They're parents. Yet over the years, as the parents feed and clothe first that baby, and then that toddler, and then that child, as they play with that child, as they teach that child, as they encourage the child, as they guide and discipline the child, they are more parent in a way than they were on the day the child was born, are they not? Technically, they became parents on the day of the child's birth, but 18, 36, or even 54 years later, They are still parents in a different way. Right, Kathy? You still, you still call your mom when you're driving home from Florida. <laughs> She's still your parent. Parenting is a done deal on the day of the birth, but it's also a daily development. It's something you became and something you become. And the same is true in our walk with God. Can a person be more justified with God than the first day of their salvation? When they recognize and receive that gift from God? No. But a person can grow? Absolutely. And we see these gifts clearly 
in the cross as the blood and the water pour out from Jesus' side. Max Lucado writes, The blood is God's sacrifice and marks us as God's children. The water is God's Spirit in us, and we need both. We need both. Notice the Gospel writer says they came out together. We need both. Some will forget the water while they accept the blood. They accept the blood, but they forget the water. They want to be saved, but they don't want to be changed. Others accept the water, but forget the blood. They're busy for Christ, but not at peace with God. What about you? Do you lean one way or the other? Can one be so right with God that he or she never serves? But we're here for a reason. To glorify God in service. Or is our tendency the opposite? Maybe one has a fear of not being good enough or not belonging to God, and so you don't trust your teammate to get your picture into the book of life. So you think you must keep performing. If that's you, know this, God's grace is sufficient for you. You are marked with Christ's blood. You belong to God. The prize is secure. Rest in that security and ask the one who gave you that gift how to unwrap it and put it into practice each and every day as we follow the way of Jesus. Amen. Please pray with me. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the gift of the cross. We thank you for your way, O oh Lord, that stands in opposition to the ways of empire. Lord, we are still crying out, save us. In this day, in this time, help us to turn our, our, our eyes towards you. and away from those who promise to fix it on their own. Lord, it's only through Your Spirit working through us, through the people, it's only through Your Spirit working beyond us in ways that we can never even imagine or expect. Help us to put our faith and trust in you and you alone. Help us to follow your way. That others would know your love. That they would be invited into community and experience all that you have to offer in this life streams of living water, abundant life that you promise. We ask this day, O oh God, that you would draw us nearer to you, nearer to your precious bleeding side. Amen. Our response song is number 358, I am thine, 